All right, Daniel Medios, thanks for uh, coming on to the interview series with me. Thanks for, uh, for jumping on, mate. No, fantastic. It's a pleasure. Long time coming, <laughs> but happy to have a conversation. No worries. Well, um, we had a bit of a chance to sort of catch up uh, before this. And one of the things I was um, sort of explaining to you is I really wanted to, to have you on because I think a lot of the people that I've been speaking to, um, you know, we talk a lot about the art of, of selling. Um, and I mm -hmm. think, you know, one of the things um, that, you know, I think you, you know a lot about and, and Ebster as well is um, what we're calling sort of revenue intelligence or bringing some more of the data driven um, insights to it, which I, which I think is yeah. critical. Um, and I want to get into, but maybe just just before we get started, so people can understand your background. I mean, just give us a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a flavour of what your journey has been like at at Ebster. I mean, you've been there almost ten years. Um, I believe you, you started as a as a product manager there. I mean, walk us through that that journey because you've 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 seen the whole evolution of it. Yeah, it's quite it's been quite the journey, an amazing journey so far. So, I joined Ebster as you mentioned almost ten years ago now. Um, actually my first job out of university and at that point i was hooked on startups and i wanted to join a mission-driven organization and truth be told i applied for an account management role and um during the interview process the founders saw something in me that i didn't realize at the time and truthfully didn't understand they said account management's great but dan you're a product guy you obsess on the details, you obsess about the customer, and you really think about how you can add value. So I think that was a, a fortunate event for me, certainly. Um, but it was um, certainly baptism of fire. So when I first joined, we had an idea, very much an idea on a piece of paper, to be honest with you. And I took responsibility for designing it, building it, launching it. And thankfully that was a success, early doors. Um, and I've repeated the process, but my role has rapidly evolved where I've really focused myself around what I would deem to be the number one business priority at all times. Whatever it may be, mm. I'm going to lock on to that. So in the early stages, it was launching a product. But then we started to market that product. We started to sell the product. Then we had customers. And uh, we're building out a customer success team. So gradually, I've just taken more and more responsibility for these different components of the business because I ultimately believe that your you're designing an organization around your customer. And so all of these different components really support their success. Um, and over the last few years, we've launched um, two or three more products into the marketplace to add more and more value to our customers and um, expand our own market and the reach, um, which thankfully have all been successful. But today my title is Chief Growth Officer and I think day to day, my, my focus is on defining the vision and strategy for the organization and overseeing different cross-functional teams to really execute on that um, and just build that alignment to what we're trying to achieve, um, which isn't necessarily commonplace, but it's something that we've seen a lot, a lot of positive results from by um, actually rather than having a silo department, we're all one team trying to achieve success for our customers and it's just building that perfect harmony. So that's my sort of day-to-day -day focus right now. That's awesome. And they've definitely let you chase the ball um, around, haven't yeah. they? That's, that's great. I mean, there's, there's something about um, startups and tech companies or even just sort of innovative companies that I think give us such a, mm -hmm. a room to grow on. That, personally, that must've been really quite fulfilling, I guess, to you know, to be able to progress through those different roles and feel like you're always working on the most high impact um, part of the business. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, um, it's where the real learning's done. Mm. Um, I think putting yourself in a position where, um, you know, oftentimes I talk to individuals and uh, a good mentor of mine said it to me um, very early on in my career. 
in terms of the decisions that I needed to make. They go, many people say they've had 10 years experience doing a job, but is that one year learning and nine years repeating the same thing? <laughs> yeah. Or is it 10 years of learning? Yeah. And that, that has a big impact on me. And so, um, you know, startups are mad um, and they're not for the faint hearted. There's no half measures um, in a lot of ways, but um, to have that exposure, to get, you know, as close to the cold face as possible and understand the impact of the decisions that you make is I think crucial to our development. I think again, some people are either doing the same job and repeating it, or they're doing it in an echo chamber or in an isolated environment. And individuals are then maybe two, three, four degrees away from what's happening and not necessarily getting the feedback quick enough. Mm. Whereas in a small startup where you're wearing multiple hats and you're again, typically on the front line, um, you feel and know the impact of every decision you make and whether it's good or bad, you get the, the immediate understanding as to what impact that's had and you can recalibrate, readjust and learn from that. One of the things I love about having these conversations when I speak to people in growth is everyone mm. always has such a sideways path into it. Um, you know, like people have come through sales, people have come through marketing, you know, people have come from all, you know, all different parts of the business. And I think it's quite interesting that you've, you've come from product. Um, I, I suppose, you know, on that, do you, how do you kind of draw that link between product and growth? Cause I know, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about product led growth and you know, that, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that you know, make software that have viral things built into it and, you know, all the rest of it, the product essentially stands in for a sales team. But I mean, how do you, you know, in a, in a business where it's, you know, sort of B2B and you're you know, selling to real people and, you know, how do you, how do you see that link between that product that you guys have built and, and sort of bring it to market? Yeah, absolutely. I think, truthfully, I, I think they're an extension of one another. I think when you're living in a B2B SaaS environment, the product is the heartbeat of the organization. Um, and when you're, when you're in a product role, it's very specific. But you are truly the value creator as, as far as I'm concerned. And you're obsessing specifically on what my customers' challenges, what problems they have and how can I solve them? Um, and you're focused on ensuring that they continue to see that value. The, the role of growth, I believe, is almost that commercial layer around that core product. And I think you're focused more on helping more customers solve that problem faster. Mm. And so you're, you're expanding, therefore, your reach and scope. You're looking at um, how can we start to, you know, who is my target audience? How can I start to attract them in? How can I then convert them in, help them realize that aha moment, um, but then retain them over the long term where the business is seeing the value that you promised. And you're mindful of, I believe, the the new and organic challenges that are likely to bubble up for your customers where you can then lean into that. And that's where, if you pay your cards right, you can start to expand your offering and increase, um, you know, the, the, the number of use cases that you support or the, the value you provide and incrementally increase the retention rates and LTV with e each of these customer accounts that you have. But um, in a growth role, I think, you're also looking at crucially understanding what's working, what's not working. And you're building out to me, a series of processes that support flywheels. Mm. Um, and they the success of those is what really, in my opinion, propels your business forward. Um, and so the, the product is at the very heart, but the growth is the connecting elements to, I believe the, the commercial reality um, where you are attracting more people in and, and ensuring they achieve long-term success. Oh, I mean, definitely. And I think that's such a great way to put it as well. I mean, 
particularly in growth and in sales, I think we often just think about, you know, how do I put things in the bucket? How do I you know, put customers and revenue in the bucket? But, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to build the bucket and, you know, also make sure it doesn't have a, a leaky, leaky floor to it. So um, I think that's a, that's a really good way to, to put it. Um, so well, I, I, I do also believe on, on that point, uh, I think it's, um, the growth role in is a challenging one, largely because you're operating horizontally rather than verti vertically. Mm. And I think that's, that's really a new trend that I'm seeing more and more where people are looking for cross-functional teams to support the full customer life cycle. Mm. And so um, for anyone embracing the role of growth in whatever guise, I think um, some of the successes that you will see almost instantaneously is simply sitting down and getting the metrics that matter, but the ones that align to the customer journey. What was the enlightening exercise for us as a business is I got a whiteboard. I do love my whiteboards mm -hmm. and I put them all together and said, let's all contribute to what this customer journey looks like. Let's see the pinch points and what are the measurements against that and who's responsible for it because you can't do it all. And more often than not, your most effective work is done collaboratively. Yeah. And so um, for growth, you're looking at that full customer life cycle and actually the moments that matter on that journey and then collaborating with the teams, but you are owning the data and success of that. And that's what you need to bring to the table consistently. So a little moment for me um, early on um, that really changed fundamentally my understanding of growth and, and the potential that it could provide. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I suppose for me, it's, it's an interesting one because I've, you know, the, pro the product side has probably been, been the thing I've sort of you know, least kind of worked on um, directly. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I've, um, I wanted to ask you, so I heard this term um, revenue intelligence a couple of years ago. And I thought that's a, that's a cool, that's a cool term. Um, yeah. You know, we want to get more intelligent uh, around that. But um, and I've seen more and more people kind of using it. Um, I don't really know what it means at the heart. Uh, I, I'd sort of be, you know, I'd be interested to get your, your take of it. I mean, I think, yeah, you guys are a revenue intelligence platform, but maybe just to break mm -hmm. it down for people who have never heard that term, thinking, well, what does that actually mean? Kind of getting more intelligent about that. And I guess maybe just a, a follow on if you want to take it as well. I mean, how much of the tool set that we use in sales has, has sort of changed off, off the back of, of that. I mean, I've, I've seen sort of um, platforms like yours, you know, definitely weren't around 20 years ago. Um, but sure. it'd be interesting to see how that kind of all, all kind of comes into that, that thing of us getting more intelligent, quote unquote, about, about bringing revenue into the business. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I will start with revenue intelligence yes. and certainly then tackle that second question, sort of the trends that I've seen over the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years. But mm. um, revenue intelligence for me is very much a new and exciting category. Um, to your point, it's probably only really been around for the last two or three years. But truthfully, um, it's been the last six to 12 months in times of so much change and uncertainty, of course, that we've all felt, where it's come into its own and it started to truly explode. Now, personally, I believe that the revenue intelligence space is the most exciting space in sales and MarTech period right now. Um, I would be slightly biased with Ebster and Ebster's role in it, but there's many other great companies out there in a sim in the similar sort of space of revenue intelligence. You've got tools like Clary, Gong, Insight Squared, and a whole host of others who are all trying to say, solve similar problems in some form. But revenue intelligence, or let's say the revenue intelligence platforms are what I would call decision engines for revenue teams. These platforms plug straight into the heart of the action. They're thinking into your CRM system. They're looking at emails, 
calendars, calls, and they're coming to understand that activity and analyzing the pipeline to deliver real-time data-driven insights that's improving forecasting accuracy, which, is, which has been a burden for sales leaders for many, many generations in terms of understanding what's really going to happen and what our belief is in what we can achieve end of quarter, uh, whatever it may be. But also day-to-day -day pipeline management because competition is fierce right now. And we're always competing, trying to catch up with ourselves and find the quick wins. And so with better visibility, you know, managers are now able to keep their finger on the pulse and reps are able to dive into specific deals and determine what they need to do to improve their chance of success. And so it's this holistic system um, that I think really now extends beyond what I believe are the you know, limitations of a CRM which is a wonderful tool, but a system of record. Now what leaders need are the insights with accurate data to improve forecasting accuracy and understand the performance of their organization. They're able to certainly with one-on-ones or pipeline reviews, truly understand the health of all of the deals that they have, but they have context around all of that. So when they're sitting down with reps, who are also utilizing the same tools, everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet. And it serves from the board level down to the reps on the front line who are executing, where they almost have a co-pilot advising them with the insights they need on the current state of play, where you're heading, where you are, and most importantly, what you need to do about it to, as I mentioned before, increase your chance of success. So I think that's, that's the big area in and around revenue intelligence, but it's um, because it's such a new and explosive category right now, it's also changing very, very quickly and evolving beyond initially the sales team. It will start to extend across everything. So you will be understanding what accounts to target to increase your chances of building out the right pipeline to ensure you have the pipeline coverage for not just this quarter, but future quarters. And you're looking at customer attention. How can I carry over the successes we've seen um, through the pipeline and closing that business forward where we can increase our chance to retain those customers or potentially expanding them? And when you look at it holistically like that, where you're focused on giving reps in each of those different areas the insights to prioritize their world, um, you're bringing into, into account many, many more data points to be smarter through prediction. And, you know, of course, AI and machine learning is all rolled into that as well. So is it, is it sort of like, um, cause like the CRM basically just holds data or information, but we're sort of then mm -hmm. going, we're, we're then going up from that and being like, yeah, what, you know, what are the insights and like, you know, what are the signals and, you know, try, trying to build knowledge and then, you know, ideally wisdom on, on top of all of that. So we can say, okay, well, we've seen these repeating patterns that we all miss because they're just in the CRM and, you know, reports are kind of limited. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe to your point, yeah, like supporting those, those salespeople kind of who are in the art of sales to, to kind of give them a, a bit of a co-pilot. That's, that's just like generally what we're kind of trying to do here. Absolutely that, absolutely that. The CRM systems are wonderful, but they are systems of record mm -hmm. rather than systems of insight. And they're often compromised by poor data, for example, and they don't necessarily have the tool set to provide those comparisons or unlock the insights where people go, that's the decision that I now need to make. And oftentimes there's a disconnect between the managers utilizing CRM for reports and then the reps on the front line who are going, what do I now need to do beyond being held accountable to I don't know how many calls I make a day or how many emails I send and, and things like that, which are just arbitrary metrics that ensure that you've got consistent input, but you don't necessarily know how effective that is. Um, and I think the emergence of the revenue intelligence tools is to give everyone the insights they need to improve performance. Mm. So I wanted to ask you as well about 
um, forecasting. Now, this this is something that I've seen work to various degrees in different sales organizations. Some people don't do it at all. Um, mm -hmm. Some people are very sort of, you know, rigid and kind of, you know, quite complex systems for them. But I mean, if you just, if you just take a stock standard client that, that comes to you and they say, you know, I've got these challenges with, with forecasting, um, you know, generally like what are those? And I guess what are some of the actual tips that people can take away to, 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 to improve that? Cause it's, it's a, it's a big part of, I guess, what a lot of revenue leaders sort of spend their time on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot out there. To be honest, a lot of challenges around yeah. forecasting. And I think it starts from the foundation and then the problem sort of builds from that point. So truthfully, very few people know how to forecast and how to forecast effectively. What does it, you know, what do I need to take into account here? What considerations do I need to have? Who needs to be involved in the forecasting? It is it a lone wolf in isolation? Or should it actually be a collaborative exercise? That's not clear. That's not understood. And it's not necessarily part of the ethos or philosophy of many revenue generating teams. You've also got challenges around, again, the fundamentals, but the setup and configuration. Are you utilizing the CRM system? Or are you trying to export that data into spreadsheets? And then how do you maintain all of these different um, places that you go for information and when you are putting that data have you got accurate data that's feeding it in the first place I think there's um, still even today a chronic challenge around the data that people have access to and what the data really represents and what it means and how it ties to some of your business processes and with that all being said and done again people are still leaning on gut feeling. I think I could hit this. I think I could do that. And the way that uh, legacy CRM systems are designed to support forecasting is still stage-based. Mm. And to me, fundamentally, it doesn't work. And I've seen the data to prove that. Um, a stage is an arbitrary line in the sand. But crucially for me, a stage is a representation of a seller's led journey. Mm -hmm. And what the new businesses need to move to is a buyer's journey and under meeting the buyer where they are and understanding what that means for organization to then predict against. And that opens up a whole manner of different insights. You can start to look at things like intent. You can look at product usage. You can look at the relationships you have, the level of engagement that you have. All of these next generation data points or KPIs to tr truly inform what's happening with the forecast. But again, um, too often people are relying on gut feeling. They're neglecting reports. They're too cumbersome to pull together. Um, they're not shared collectively across the teams and they're, oftentimes compromised by poor data. So the actual tip for me um, is firstly, set up your CRM where you've got accurate data and probably start building the reports out, um, even the standard reports they've got. So you go from nothing to at least something, but I still think you're cutting corners because honestly the future is revenue intelligence. And for me, it's a cheat code for many world-class sales leaders today. Because you can plug in the system, automatically collects all of the data that you need. It gives you the immediate insights and it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting with the support of AI machine learning to go, this is where you are. This is why we believe you're here. And it's delivering the insights to actually coach and guide the teams. And it's taking it from a data set that's far greater than even just your organization. You're effectively pulling together the insights and understanding from all of the companies utilizing all of these platforms and they're just becoming better and better and better and obsessing on that very single focus, which is how can we improve uh, forecasting accuracy, if not revenue performance as a whole. And um, these are the sort of tools that you want to partner with to be really successful. 
And I think you need to consider bringing them into the equation sooner because the impact of the results that you see will compound from having these tools and accurate data faster because you're then building an arsenal of knowledge that will help you to inform and accelerate on future decision making. But there's so much to unpack there. I really like that idea of the buyer-led versus the seller-led um, journey. I think that's that's really cool. Um, one uh, one thing. So when one, of, I can't remember when it was, but one of when we spoke about about Ebster a few few months ago, potentially, you said something yeah. to me that just like really stood out. And you were talking about how the whole sales process is sort of mediated through this relationship, like relationships, relationship we have with with the buyer and, you know, uh, I think for a lot of sales organizations that looks like, you know, one person, maybe me selling to you and it's all fairly, you know, straightforward. But, you know, we mm -hmm. now live in this world where, um, you know, potentially larger businesses and even, you know, even, even smaller ones now have more people involved in the, in the, in the, in the process. And um, I think the really thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, can, can you unpack that idea of, you know, sales you know, being so much, you know, based on relationships and, I guess what what are the challenges that that you're seeing with your clients, you know, trying to manage, you know, a relationship between you know one of their salespeople and say you know three buyers inside that organisation or or vice versa? Because I think I think that's like pretty pretty key to to what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for us at Ebster, we recognise that um, despite all of the wonderful tools and processes and automations you have. They're all facilitating a single thing, which is people buy from people. And our overarching philosophy is that um, relationships drive revenue. And what we've really focused on is understanding what that means. What is that really about? So we um, analyze the number of relationships that you have. And I think it's common knowledge that year, year on year, we're seeing more and more people involved in sales processes. In fact, we recently did analysis of more than $100 billion of pipeline through 2020 into 2021 to see what, how has the world changed um, as a result of um, the sudden shifts that we're seeing in behavior. Um, and the fact of the matter is that there's more and more relationships now than ever before in every sales process. And that probably, that's probably because of, um, you of course want more and more opinions, whatever it may be, but the decisions are becoming more and more crucial to an organization. And so more likely to get buy-in from different stakeholders who utilize some tools that are going to spread far and beyond that individual who'd otherwise be buying it for themselves. You're buying tools that could possibly affect hundreds, if not thousands of users. And um, it's crucial that you have every stone unturned so you're not actually finding out later down the line that this isn't quite working for someone. So we see strong correlation where uh, there's almost an optimum number of relationships. And what we're seeing now is it sits somewhere between five and six. Um, 12 months ago, it's probably three and four. So it's gradually increasing. And um, that's where the win rate is typically three to four X on deals with less than that number of stakeholders. But it's all the same can also be said for having too many stakeholders. Um, there's some industries like finance, we have more and more stakeholders involved, but there's a point of no return. And the sweet spot for us is somewhere between four and six relationships, depending on the nature of your business. And with that, um, for us, relationships are built upon engagement. We've lived in a world for far too long where we think activity is the build and end all. And um, it's input, let's send an email, let's make a call. But to us, it's all about the reciprocation of that um, activity and what that looks like over time. So we have developed our own way of understanding that with the engagement score. And again, if you're looking at managing opportunities of high engagement, the win rates are five, six, 
seven times what they would otherwise be if you've got a tepid relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's crucial really to, as ever, focus on building high quality relationships and truly understanding them. And it's such a crucial indicator of your chances of success. And the data for us demonstrates that if you have a great relationship at the beginning, you're going to be creating more pipeline faster from those relationships. If you are managing the deals in a similar way with the right number of stakeholders, again, the sales velocity comparison is remarkable. You're closing more deals uh, more efficiently, faster. Um, and again, it cascades down to retention of customers. You have to have relationships at the core. You have to be focused on increasing engagement. And it's not when was the last activity for a person. It's a relationship. It's got to be authentic. You've got to have those, um, that to and froing and the different channels of communication all factored in to understand that. And for me, I think what's crucial is understanding engagement is a great place to start because it's something you can control. And I believe so passionately about this that you've got your classic sales KPIs like win rate, sales cycle, deal value. I think relationships and engagement need to be part of this magic five now. Mm. I think they have to be woven into everyone's understanding of what really matters because when you have the right number of relationships and engagement's high, the sales velocity is really, really impressive. Um, but it's also something you can control. I can control how many people I'm trying to target and I can control or at least understand the engagement. So the final thing comes down to prioritization of that. Um, there's so much inefficiency in sales as people jump from one thing to the next. What do I need to prioritize right now? We well, want to look at... Um, you want to move away from a world where you've got blind spots or analysis paralysis and gut filled. You go, right, am I talking to the right person? You know, what, what's the ICP? Have I got the right type of stakeholder? You want to look at um, why and when you're reaching out to them. What's the intent like? You don't want to be reaching out to somebody prematurely. So leverage some of the insights that marketing typically have to go right place, right time. I'm reaching out to this person with context around all of that. You need to understand what you're trying to achieve as well. And that's, we talked earlier about the buyer's journey, but it's up to a salesperson's role is not to sell, it's to help somebody buy. Yes. And you need to guide them through the stages, not because it works for you and your manager's telling you, oh, okay, you need to take them to this stage, this stage, this stage. You're doing it because you're, almost operating like a partner in their knowledge and understanding of a problem, possible solutions, and then the trust and confidence that you have the right solution. But you need to temper the right engagement, the right activity to support that stage of the progression. Um, and so to me, again, I think we're, we're now living in a world where we've got so many people we can reach out to, so many different insights. And I think it's about, but we've only got a finite amount of capacity to make an impact. And automation, as we know, is, is, has had its time. And that's accelerated over the last 10 years. Now it's about impact. And I think it's building engagement with the right people at the right time and, and nurturing through the right stages of that buyer's journey, I think is crucial but relationships and engagement has to be at the fore because it's one thing you can focus in on. It's one thing you can control. I, th I think one of the things I really enjoy about speaking to you, Daniel, is you, you change my mind on so many things <laughs> every time we speak. So, <laughs> so um, I think that's, that's really good. I'm, I'm really keen to unpack a lot of that. Um, but look, you've, you've been so generous with your, with your time today. Um, I guess if I could ask you one Last question, if I could sneak it in. One of the things I, I really like to, to ask people is, you know, what, what are your sort of like contrarian views on growth? And sort of like by that, I sort of mean, you know, is there a piece of advice that everyone just gives each other that's just plainly wrong, that we all accept it? You know, or is there something that you guys are doing that, you know, you'd be screaming out like, hey, this really works, but no one else in the industry 
really knows anything about it. And that, yeah, that could be just whatever comes to mind. But I, uh, I often feel like we all read these same books from airport bookstores and we're all telling each other these, these same stories about you know, what it means to grow a company. But I'd be interested to hear you know, what, if any of that's massively wrong to you or if you think there's anything that a lot of people are overlooking. It's a great question. And I'd probably have to mull it over uh, as <laughs> me with, with how I typically operate. But, um, and, and, and this may be, you know, in certain areas well understood anyway, but um, I think truthfully, and I go from my own experience, um, I've read, like you say, um, many books, um, about this whole world and everyone is obsessed on scaling um, because that's the answer to all your problems and it will accelerate that growth. But I think um, none of the success we've had today is by prioritizing scaling. Mm. I think scaling comes afterwards. I think a lot of people focus on building operational masterclasses and having all of the efficiency in the world. But I think um, the, the true indicator for success is following through on processes that are delivering results, but it's a hard grind. It's that sort of focus on um, how close can I get to it rather than having reports and automations and triggers, I'm probably gonna have to have phone calls and talk to people and understand different things. And it's just building through that piece that I think has probably been the key ingredient for our success mm. because um, you, you can't replace it. You can't replace that immediate access, that feedback, loop, that understanding as to what's happening at the core, but they never, those processes never scale. But as a result, we would have been continually following a path and trying to scale it up and increase efficiency when we're, blind with our blinkers on to the wider and bigger opportunities that lie just outside of our immediate sphere. I think people go, I've got product market fit. Let's go, let's go there, come hell or high water. And the reality is it's a bit more of a, a zigzag on the journey. And um, I think even if you do have product market fit, many businesses now um, accelerate and you've got 12 months, maybe 18 months to execute on your go to market strategy and then everything's changed. Mm. And so I think it's a very high risk. Um, and that used to be three or four years. People had a little bit more time, but as VC market is poured um, into more concentrated areas of the B2B SaaS landscape, um, you've got, once you demonstrate what's working, you've got 12 to 18 months to execute on it. Otherwise it's passed. And so, to think that what you have there and scaling it is enough is, as I say, risky. I think it's, um, is, you know, almost Jeff Bezos, I think, says that Amazon every day is day one. Mm -hmm. And you've always got to be um, reassessing, I believe, whatever beliefs you had yesterday, because half of them are probably wrong today. Yep. Um, and again, that's why you need to be so close to the action rather than trying to scale, 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 because then you're just blindly building operations without an understanding as to what's working, what's not working. Yeah. I really, I really need to remember who wrote this, but there's a, there's a bit, um, there's a post I saw as they say, if you're in a meeting and you want to sound smart, just ask the question, does this scale? Um, and like, that's, it's almost like this endless question that we're all asking each other, which is like, has no bearing on, you know, well, yeah. Often with all the things that we're we're doing, so I think that, that's a great point. Um, but um, Daniel, look, this has been amazing, and I, I, you know, I'd love to, I guess, point people towards maybe some of the other stuff you've written or some of the things that EBS has sort of put out, because I think there's a lot, um, you know, that that you guys can kind of educate sales leaders on. Is there some way that people should be looking to learn about some of the things that you've um, discussed today, or where's the best sort of resource um, that you can point people towards? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, people are free to connect with me on LinkedIn or drop me an email at daniel.ebs.com. Um, lots of my thinking 
is realized through EBSTA in some form or another, but I will soon be releasing my website, which was just danielremedios.com. So uh, keep an eye out for that. But yeah, happy to connect with people and continue these conversations because together we can learn some you know, new ways of doing things, improving as we go. Awesome. Thank you so much, mate. And uh, yeah, I'll hopefully uh, connect with you again for, for a round two at some point down the line.